I met Dr. Hunsberger oh, a couple years ago at a conference uh, that was held at his seminary, Western Theological Seminary. And um, some of the stuff that he covered was about uh, the missional church. And I remember sitting in the room uh, with uh, a bunch of my um, peers and colleagues and just taking it all in and just loving it. So I'm excited for you folks to be able to hear some of the things that I was exposed to. Um, maybe it's new for you, maybe it's familiar, but uh, I think at the very least you're going to be blessed. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Hunsberger now. Thank you, and I'm very pleased to be in this part of the world. I have been to Portland before, that is, I was here yesterday, and I was actually here part of Monday, and that is the extent of it. I'm really pleased to be able to visit this area because uh, I've heard lots about weird Portland. Is that the right adjective to use? Uh, Self-chosen, I gather. I've heard uh, a lot about Multnomah and have met some of uh, the folks that are on the staff here at various places and have come to really value this institution, what you're working at, and particularly this Doctor of Ministry degree that I've now been able to be a part of. There are about a dozen of you or so that I've spent a couple of days with. Hi, you're my cheering section. If things go badly, just, just clap. Uh, it's been a fun couple of days working at what the gospel does and is in the midst of human cultures and all the intricacies of those dynamics for each of us, every one of us, for the churches all over the world. So that's been a, a very great opportunity to listen to the, the energies and the wrestling that people are doing in their ministry settings. I don't know what you have thought about the phrase missional church. I have a lot of friends that are dazed by it. I have friends who are bothered by it being used so much. I have others that are fired up about it, others that are stumbling to get away from it. It is uh, quite a zoo out there when it comes to that phrase. My intention tonight is to dive headlong into some of that muddiness and murkiness of the phrase or what it does mean or what it doesn't mean. I've been teaching at Western Theological Seminary for 25 years. We have that word theological in our name so that people don't mistake us for Portlanders at a seminary out this way. Where exactly is that? Uh, we're the easternmost Western seminary in the country is what I tell people. But I want to dive headlong into an engagement of that phrase. And I do it with a sense of my own personal investment in the things that have led along the way to cultivating that kind of notion about who we are as the church, what we exist for, why we are. I was one of six who spent several years together writing the book by that title, Missional Church. The Sending of the Church, A Vision for the Sending of the Church in North America. We were working modestly to say we're not talking about or for people in other parts of the world. We're trying to do our homework and learn from what has happened elsewhere in churches that have arisen in many societies and have learned something of their own missional character. We were wanting to learn from them and also draw on the resources of especially the field of missiology over recent decades. And we were wanting to give expression to that dynamic of the church that we had come to believe so deeply is essential to its character. We did that not quite knowing whether there would be any who read it and paid attention to it. We did it not quite knowing if it would resonate with anyone. We did it not quite knowing whether that sort of cumbersome phrase, missional church, would ever be anything that would lodge with people as important to their own view of who we are as the church. It has turned out that that has been picked up, it has been used, it has been moved all around, and we've come to a time now 
16 years after the book was published, a time in which most publishing houses will publish a lot of books if you have the word missional in the title or subtitle. And if you don't have it there, they might even suggest that you put it there. Now, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but you'll hear my ruminations. And out of this, uh, the ruminations I share tonight are sort of out of a concern for the diversity of that language and what it has come to mean, what it is used for, what it says, what people intend to use it to say, but also to represent what, in all of those engagements, I have conviction about in terms of the way in which I would see, and I would think some of my colleagues who were the other authors would also see, about what it means when you put the word missional in front of the word church. What happens? What kind of phrase is that? What kind of affirmation? What kind of commitment does that indicate? Those are the six of us that wrote the book together, Ina Grace and Al and Craig and Daryl and Lois and myself. Daryl Guter was the team leader in the research project and the writing project leading to the publication of the book, and he's listed as the editor. He did mutter more than a few times toward the end of the three and a half year process. It's like herding cats. Uh, we, we were cats. It, we, we had cat fights now and then, but it was both a wonderful experience and a very tough experience at the same time. The collegiality that we experienced on the way to writing a book together that we owned in its broad strokes and in the details that each of us provided at different points was an amazing experience. But now, Al, one of the team, has found occasion frequently to say something like this. A, year, a number of years ago, he published a book, and in the beginning, he started out saying, the word missional is a word that has gone from obscurity to banality in eight short years. Now, he said that as he was penning yet another book that had missional in the title. So he wasn't saying it to abandon the word, but to alert all of us to the fact that overuse of a word can feel like it has lost all of its luster, all of its meaning, or it can multiply its meanings, and that can also be difficulty. David Bosch, of course, anticipated Al by saying it's not just that new, newly coined, not new entirely, it's 100 years old, but that newly coined adjective to many of our vocabularies. The ambiguity there is already present, Bosch said, in the word mission. The time had come when if you use the word mission, you will need to define what you mean by mission in the life of the church. So words are useful, but well, let's listen. Uh, do you see where we're going here? Lewis Carroll, in Through the Looking Glass and What Alice Found There, talks about this conversation that Alice has with Humpty Dumpty. So let's eavesdrop on Alice's visit with Humpty Dumpty, already in progress. Humpty Dumpty observes that there are 364 days when you might get unbirthday presents. Certainly, said Alice. And only one for birthday presents, you know. There's glory for you. I don't know what you mean by glory, Alice said. Humpty Dumpty smiled contemptuously. Of course you don't, till I tell you. I meant, there's a nice knockdown argument for you. But glory doesn't mean a nice knockdown argument, Alice objected. When I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said, in rather a scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be master? That's all. Alice was too much puzzled to say anything. So after a minute, Humpty Dumpty began again. They've a temper, some of them, particularly verbs. They're the proudest. Adjectives you can do anything with, but not verbs. 
However, I can manage the whole lot of them. Impenetrability, that's what I say. Would you tell me, please, said Alice, what that means? Now you talk like a reasonable child, said Humpty Dumpty, looking very much pleased. I meant by impenetrability that we've had enough of that subject, and it would be just as well if you'd mention what you mean to do next, as I suppose you don't mean to stop here all the rest of your life. That's a great deal to make one word mean, Alice said in a thoughtful tone. When I make a word do a lot of work like that, said Humpty Dumpty, I always pay it extra. Perhaps we ought to pay missional extra, because it gets a lot of uses, meaning a lot of things. It was a number of years ago now when I was sitting in a local coffee shop in Holland, Michigan. Somehow I was musing about the work that with others had been done on this theme over the last few decades, and somehow I also was increasingly aware of the way in which many people were using the phrase missional church, and using it, it sounded to me, to serve different purposes than those that we had intended or that I believed were really its best understandings and most useful ones for us today. And as I was musing, I began to scribble on a couple of napkins. The affirmations you see on that sheet that you have in front of you all began on a couple of napkins in a coffee shop. Do you need evidence? There we are. There, there are the, the very things. And it's, it's those things that were spawned at that time that I've thought about and reflected on ever since that I would like to walk through and talk with you a bit about, invite then your questions and your comments and your engagement with some of these themes. I am suggesting that in these nine affirmations, there are things very, very important about the use of the word missional in front of the word church. And I'm going to talk about them in three clusters. I didn't realize it right away, but I realized after these nine sort of spilled down onto the napkin that they were in three clusters of three each. And that began up to lead my thinking further in the direction of how to understand their connections with each other. So you can use your pen or something and bracket the first through three pearl points. Those aren't bullet points. My Mennonite friends tell me they're pearl points. And we'll look at those three, and then we'll look at the next cluster of three and the final cluster of three. The first cluster is what I would suggest is an identity cluster. At the heart of the intentions that we had in the book Missional Church was that the phrase would render the identity of the Church of Jesus Christ. Not just add something to its agenda, not just circle it with another perspective, but to strike right at the heart of what is the identity of the church. Let me look at the third of those first as a way into the other two. <clears throat> I confess that I've been bothered at times when I hear people speaking or writing about becoming a missional church. Okay, becoming a missional church. If mission and missional means someone, something that has been sent. How do you become sent? The sent one doesn't have to become sent, especially if we have already been sent. And we have been sent. We have been sent already by Jesus. That is enough to make us a missional church by our very character, in our very essence. That is the nature of who we are. And the Holy Spirit, who is the one who creates the church, who constitutes the church by the Spirit's own power, 
has made us to be this kind of community, one that is missional in the sense that we have been sent and charged and called and moved into the participation with Jesus in the mission to which Jesus also was sent. It is in the time of Jesus' resurrection on that second Lord's Day when he visited with the disciples in an upper room. Thomas had not been there the first time, but now Thomas also joins and sees the scars, recognizes the life of Jesus, that this Lord now has risen. But here is what Jesus says when Jesus joins them. It was evening on that day, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. I have looked at both of those last two statements independently of each other a lot of times, but it is stunning when you recognize these two come together. As the Father sent me, I send you. And he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus has sent us, and that is what makes us missional in character. It is not something we then have to try to become. The Spirit has been breathed upon us, and I almost want to say breathtakingly, but maybe breath-givingly, the Spirit has made us this kind of community. Now certainly, I'm aware that in our experience of being the church in the North American context in these recent days, weeks, months, years, decades, Things have changed considerably in our environment, and we have begun to recognize ourselves in churches across the country, as, as I know us. We have recognized something about our identity that seems to have gotten lost along the way, something about our recognition of it, something about our remembering has been affected. When we lost it, and how long ago we lost it, and how far we've lost it, are matters perhaps to be discussed, but in any case, we are discovering in a fresh way, many of us, that in fact, this is something of our character that we had not been thinking about, not recognizing, and therefore, in many ways, we discover the shaping and the framing of how we do our life together as a church may in fact be things that do not enhance the possibilities of fulfilling what we are, and in fact might interfere with life lived as a missional community. So there are things to be recovered, certainly. There are things we need to learn again. There are lost memories to be regained, and there are imaginations to cultivate. This does not mean there isn't work to be done. It is not time to settle back and say, well, since the Holy Spirit has made us this, there's nothing we need to do about this. Well, we need certainly to pay attention to how the Spirit shows us what is true of us and how the Spirit moves us among people around us, moves us into connection with them in all the walks of life, in the social fabric that we share, and moves us in a way to be those who bear the witness that the Spirit gives to Jesus. That identity cluster has as its foundation that some, this is something the Holy Spirit makes true for us. And because of that, it affirms that it is in fact inherent in our calling. It is essential to our identity. And we, in this part of the world, have been learning it's not just true of churches elsewhere, as we might one day have thought. In fact, it is true of every church in any place where it finds itself. Next, we'll look at the second cluster of three, which I call the alignment cluster. How does the church align itself with what is true of us 
in that fundamental identity as the sent witnesses of Christ. Here I draw your attention first to the middle term among those three. Putting missional in front of the word church is a theological commitment about the intentions and actions of God for the world. This is speaking, of course, in some alternate terms about the gospel that Jesus spoke, that Jesus called his good news that he was announcing to all who heard him. That gospel, he said, is this, the reign of God is at hand. Turn around and believe this gospel. It did not stop with that utterance included early in the synoptic gospels. That, in fact, is offered early because it's a theme for all that will follow. Jesus consistently always spoke about the reign of God. It was to announce that reign that his life was given. He was the one who was the voice of that reign, the one in whom it was embodied, the one who bore it into the presence of the rest of us in the world. Turn around and believe this good news, he said. This is the central affirmation of the teaching of Jesus. Mortimer Arias, a Methodist bishop from Latin America, has written a book by the title you see there. In fact, I have borrowed his book uh, cover photograph at this point, Announcing the Reign of God. You know, there are some old books that are three decades old that still feel like they were expressed next week. And I have that feeling about Mortimer Arias's book. All the way through, he talks about the fact that his own investigation had led him to look into the New Testament and particularly in the Gospels and say, what did the Gospels show us? What did they put forward? What did they portray? And what do they then say? And what does Jesus in those Gospel accounts say is the Gospel. He comes to this conclusion, first finding. Jesus' good news is none other than the good news of the kingdom. And Jesus himself was the first evangelist of the kingdom. Second finding, the kingdom of God theme has practically disappeared from evangelistic preaching and has been ignored by traditional evangelism. The evangelistic message has been centered in personal evangelism, individual conversion, and incorporation into the church. The kingdom of God as a parameter or perspective or as the content of the proclamation has been virtually absent. He goes on to refer to this as the eclipse, while also reminding us that there nonetheless lurks in the shadows a subversive memory about what Jesus said here. If this was Jesus' evangelization, kingdom evangelization, why have we lost sight of it? It seems that we have for a long time experienced an eclipse of the kingdom. The message and perspective of the kingdom of God has always been there in the biblical record, in the memory of the church, and in the mission of the people of God. It has been a subversive memory. While this was said three decades ago, it still strikes me that there is a relevance to watching and looking and welcoming the signs that this subversive memory persists. Now, in one sense, I'd have to say, since Arius wrote this book and since a lot of people read it and that helped us to catch on to this memory, uh, there has been a lot of recovery across the country, I believe, among church leaders and members and the way in which we think of ourselves as the church and think of the mission upon which we've been placed. The recovery of the kingdom of God, the reign of God as a fundamental theme has been very notable and welcome. I don't think that means, however, that there is not yet work to be done because pressing that into the fabric, into the dynamic of our life together as a church is still something that begs for further 
pastoral work and for further work by all of us in the life of the church. What will it mean to continue to recognize that the reign of God is our birthright? It has given us birth. The Catholic theologian Hans Kung, when talking about the question, what is the essence of the church anytime in history, anywhere that it's located, says that amidst all those changing forms that the church invariably will show to have, what is of the essence in all of those cases is the church's origins in the gospel. And it is this gospel of the reign of God that are those origins. How does that nourish our understanding? How does that press us forward? It's something that to be regained, but at the very minimum, it is this that I believe is fundamental in terms of what missional means for the church. Because that reign of God that Jesus announced, which Jesus inaugurated, and which Jesus promises will come in full in the end, is that which we are sent to serve. We are sent to embody what it means to live in that reign as Jesus did. We are sent to exhibit its authority as we live under its authority, uh, under its authority. It, we are sent to announce that reign as Jesus did. Now, if that is true, it relates to the items right before and right after that affirmation. And I suggest that because that is fundamental, that realigns things. It says that here you have the centerpiece of a biblical narrative that itself centers in the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus at the center of the story. And in the midst of that, Jesus' own acclamation was that the meaning of his presence had to do with God's reign. It's a reign of love and care and promise. It's a reign of invitation to allegiance and loyalty. And it is the establishment of the covenant that God makes with us. Because of that, it sets a new path. And my conviction is that that path helps us to look at a couple of things in our experience as the life of the church. The uh, affirmation right before and right after that, those two affirmations are the two on the list that mostly take a bit of a sort of not quite negative term, but they show some of the things that the missional term in front of the word church would suggest. These are things that we'll get bumped into. These are things that the alignment to the reign of God will challenge, will push back on. One of those is that to say the church is missional is a contrast to the consumer-driven forms of the church. We have come to say, I have found myself uh, saying often, we have come to see that for us in the church and for people who are not in churches, there's something that us we, we Americans tend inevitably to know about what a church is. And it is shaped by economic notions of reality, of humanity, and of society, like all other things are being shaped these days. That is, a church is fundamentally, in our imaginations, a vendor of religious goods and services. It is here that you go to find the things that you desire in spiritual or religious meaning. It is here that you shop. There is a lot of literature that has been accentuating and underlining the various dimensions of that and the various implications for the life of the church. To say that we are the community birthed by the reign of God and we are the community in its service is to say this is different now from being a vendor of relig religious goods and services. And in addition, this notion of the reign of God, this notion of God bringing wholeness and reconciliation, this notion cuts against the grain in contrast and in challenge to a private individualist version of the gospel. It is 
inherently something that places us into relation to each other, that makes us one body together. This is a realignment that is implied by the use of the word missional in front of the word church. The third set of three affirmations is what I call the trajectory cluster. And I'll look at the first of those three first. Missional is a recovery of community as the people of God. Now that one is the one that might sound odd as an implication of using the word missional with the word church. But it's a, a fundamental piece of the whole portrait. It sounds odd because missional would seem to look at the way in which that community is doing things, is speaking things, is exhibiting the patterns of life that are fulfilling its mission. What we overlook is the fact that to be such a community, to be the kind of community oriented to the reign of God, to be a community that has been sent by Jesus and created by the Holy Spirit is to accent that being the community itself in full and genuine ways that inhabit what the reign of God is bringing into the world is in fact part of our mission. Our mission includes to be a living, pulsing display, a demonstration of the life of God in the midst of the world. That is to say uh, something like the phrase of Leslie Newbigin, who frequently, often would say, the church is a sign and a foretaste and an instrument of the reign of God. It is itself a sign, and that implicates a certain manner of life. And these are things that each of us as an individual believing person are not capable of doing because these are corporate things. It involves the mutual forgiveness patterns that begin to take place. It, it involves the accountabilities to the alignment of loyalties in the service of God who reigns. These are things that implicate the life of community. It gives us, in fact, the open door to cultivate ourselves as communities more and more. The Holy Spirit, in fact, who has made us a community, does not just make us such and leave that alone, but is constantly doing the things that produce this quality and character of community life among us that puts on display what the reign of God is about. Newbegin also would say the church is the hermeneutic, the interpretive lens of the gospel. This is the way people can look, feel, touch, associate in a way to discover what this looks like in real pulsing social life. So that one, a recovery of community as the people of God, leads out into the two others that I list there as affirmations. The first of those is that missional is a guide toward the church's practices, gestures, and expressions. What do we do? What kind of programmed life do we establish? What kind of schedules do we keep? Where do we meet with each other? And where do we meet and encounter others in our world? And in what way do we do that? How do we make judgments about our practices in, love, in life together? How do we discern the way the Spirit wants our community to give evidence that the reign of God is at hand? These are going to implicate practices. They in implicate gestures, all the subtle things that we do, maybe the simplest things that we do as a community. I traveled with a group of emergent church leaders they wouldn't have called themselves emergent as such, but they were part of that wave of things a decade ago and were in our region wanting to do some learning 
together over time. And on one occasion, I met with that group and asked if, if I could take an hour of their time to ask them a question that I had just been asked. I had been invited to a consultation on theology and congregational life. The leaders of the consultation at Hartford Seminary under Carl Dudley's leadership were eager to bring together people that might reflect on what counts as theology in congregational life. Somewhat, I think for many of us, we weren't going to be eager to say what counts as theology in congregational life is the formal teaching of systematic theologies, though those would be implicated, but it, it's a wider reaching sense of how theology lives in a community. How do we think about God? At any rate, we were asked to prepare some thoughts, and one of the questions given to us was, what counts as theology? Not just what we thought should count, but what does count as theology in congregational life. So with this group of seven or eight young emerging leaders of house churches and big churches, I asked them that question. And I was struck immediately with the way they looked at each other and looked at me sort of dumbfounded. And they sort of just collectively said, well, everything. These were folks in various sizes and types of living communities for whom there was the energy around every gesture, every question, every decision. How will we do this? That's a theological question. What do we understand about God? What do we understand about God's relationship to us and our neighbors? Those are questions that are germane to those smallest decisions of gestures, meeting times, gatherings, dispersions. A guide toward the church's practices, gestures, and expressions. In other words, to understand our identity as missional implicates all of those things and leads us into the open space of discernment. And as well, missional is a recognition of our public location as witness to the reign of God. I find myself these days tempted to ask groups of pastors in particular a question sort of like this. And it, as you can tell in a moment, is a, intended to jar some things a little bit loose. And so I, I would ask, where is your church most of the time? All of a sudden, we're not talking about the geography of a facility or meeting places. All of a sudden, we're not talking about programmed life, scheduled life gathering points. We're talking about something a lot broader. We're talking about the places in which a church exists, pressed into the social fabric. The places in which we live daily, rub shoulders with all kinds of folks, sometimes with each other, sharing some of those spaces, but many times, most times, living in a wider circle of relationships. The gospel itself is about not only the people who are in those public spaces that we meet, but the gospel itself is about the very life of the world. It's about the meaning of the world, of its history, the meaning of its future, its destiny, the meaning of life as it is lived in social contexts. And therefore, it touches those heart concerns of all of us making our way in living in social realities. It is a public thing that Missional points to. It is a recognition of our public location. Well, these ways in which I suggest missional functions as a word to indicate these sorts of things lead us in the end to envision fulfilling our identity 
and vocation, by testifying humbly and boldly by the power of the Spirit, by living happily in the realm of the reign of God under God's caring and loving governance, by embodying and practicing the gospel in the way of Jesus. That is our calling. So let us fulfill it. Thank you. I, I think we should have time for questions, comments, and other things. Um, if you have a question, I'm going to bring the microphone to you so that people can hear and also we can get it uh, recorded. Do you feel the word missional had gone off course? Because in my own context, which is just very subjective, the word missional didn't mean a lot of that. It meant something else, new, cool, stylish, young, hip. And it just was a condemnation to other churches. I do hear it used and watch its use in ways that I think miss these dynamics, miss these implications, yes. Uh, does that mean we should find another word? It would surely happen to the other word, too, if we found it. I, I think missional is useful, especially if we continue to look back and say, what is going on with this? What is it doing? Why have we done this? Why are we using this word? What does it point to? How does it give us? a shape of, of the future. Hi, yes. uh, my name is Hi. Joe. Hi, Joe. Um, I want to ask um, how the concept of missional church um, relates to the reorientation of missions um, now that you know most of the world has been reached by um, at least every most countries in the world have had uh, missions work at least some history of missions um, with them and and right now we we come to the understanding that missions doesn't mean a western <clears throat> centered gospel going out but that it is a reality that encompasses the whole globe and there is no center for where missions is going from. Um, and so I guess, um, how, how does that relate to uh, minority cultures? How, how, how would uh, this understanding of mission or missional church um, relate to um, their kind of perspective? Sure, thank you. I understand this use of the word missional about the church to be affirming that the church in every place where it finds itself in a local congregation is itself of this character and is therefore the sent community, sent to its environment, sent to its place. It is the reason why we are where we are located. Now, in the midst of that, it does not mean that there are not impulses and, and trajectories that will always be a part of a local community's sense of extending that news about Jesus to other places it knows about, uh, to move to other communities, and to move at great distances, as we have seen in our history. And that is where the, the missions have taken place that are sent out by the church a mission to this place or a mission to this place or to, to the people here in order to extend that witness of the gospel that the church knows it has. One of the dilemmas of the recent uh, couple of centuries, really, of such mission practice is that while mission was sort of coming into the minds of many of us European-based peoples, having forgotten it so long, it came in mind only when we discovered people elsewhere and that was where mission would take place. Mission comes into the picture when some of us go somewhere or when we send some people somewhere. The, sh the shift that missional church intends to signal is that it's not 
first of all about the church sending. It is about the church being sent. Now, having said that, and given the sense that the gospel has spread to all kinds of nooks and crannies around the world, and the church has grown rapidly in many of those places, given that, we are churches who I believe need to see our partnership with churches elsewhere and recognize fundamental responsibilities that we have where we are and that other churches have where they are and find the ways in exchange of encouragement, in exchange of presence with each other, even exchange of questions and probings with each other's way of understanding the gospel in our context. These are ways that a dialogue of the churches will be helped to, will help us all in the process. There, there still will be all kinds of things, uh, all kinds of movement taking place. Uh, you asked particularly about uh, minority groups of some sort. I would have to say that for myself, and I think for many of us that worked on the Missional Church Book Project, it is the expression of that genuine sense of identity as missional people, as a sent community, that I have seen, that I have recognized in churches of the world that would not tend to be the places we would look for all the advancements. We're not looking at people who have the great resources, but nonetheless, the resource of being that kind of people, exhibiting that quality of life, have been the things that have enriched and allowed us to begin to see this about ourselves. So there, there's a lot of that interchange that already, I believe, takes place. I don't know if that gets uh, all together to your question. But thank you. Yeah, uh, could you give us an example of what you would call the, the work or actions of a truly missional church? What would it look like? If I were to look and say, and this needs to be transcultural, what would I look at and say, oh, I see them doing that. That really does appear to be a church with a true missional heart. There are so many answers. Uh, to that. It's the whole life of the church that gets bound up in, in that imagination. It is the space in which we live together in a kind of authentic way, in a kind of way that lives with the dynamic of being forgiven people, but, but being forgiving people, that begins to put on display things that in a wider society may not be so evident or so readily seeable. It is the spirit of knowing God. If we are a foretaste, it's because we have tasted ourselves God's presence in deep, powerful ways. What that makes me think about is a small church, 50, 55 people in New Jersey, in a small, and very old town. That congregation itself is a couple of hundred years old. It has a facility that has larger space than it now can fill with the community that worships together. They have been on a journey for a couple of decades. They read the scriptures in new ways. They are listening to the scriptures in new ways, and they're doing it together. They have a spirit of discernment about what the spirit is using those scriptures to lead them to, and that gives them uh, sort of the new imagination of the way they relate to people on the streets of their town. Uh, all kinds of folks be begin to be touched by, by their care. They have now come to be recognized in town with a particular reputation, and this is what it is. Now, th this seems simple, and it didn't happen overnight. They didn't create it. It just is happening. In that town, if people who have no Christian faith at all talk to a friend, likewise, with no Christian faith or church connection at all, and they express some things they're struggling with, experiencing, troubled by, people will say, you should go over there. Those people pray. They will pray for you. Now, that's, that's one set of examples. I, you know, there are many different ways to go with this. Uh, the, the practices of the church that come into form in hospitality to strangers, that come into form as the celebration of the death and resurrection of Jesus in the Lord's Supper, 
and that do it in a way that says this is the spirit that we're inhabiting also. We're learning to be people filled with the mind of Christ in that way. Uh, those are some of the things that I'm thinking about. Dr. Hansberger. Oh, there we are. There. Thank you. I've had the privilege of being in the class that you've spoken to the last two days. And something that I like, if you could expound on here for this group, the difference between, say, being a church where you go to for the acquisition of an experience versus a church that you go to participate in a purpose. Yes. A colleague of mine, especially Jim Brownson, has painted that picture by looking at the biblical materials of the New Testament and recognizing the American habit that we are acquisitional by nature and seeing that, that God comes and does provide things for us in Christ. Nonetheless, God gains us into God's purposes in the world commissions us, charges us, invites us to that participation. And that it's something bigger than just getting something for myself. Uh, that acquisitional habit, as my colleague Jim has thought about it, is a habit that has led us increasingly in the churches to make our appeal to people in terms of an expression of the gospel that suggests there's something in this for you. Well, there's there's you in this for God's joy of being united with you and welcoming you to be those sent to bear this message yet to others. So there's a, a revolution, there's a turn that that invites us to envision. Great. Yes. Um, one question I had was when I think about the idea of missional and how people use it, Often the idea is uh, people or churches who enter into a culture and seek to change culture. So would you say that's not a proper uh, use of the idea of missional? Would that not be included in your definition of the word? Well, it depends on what somebody would mean by changing a culture. I know that you all are reading in that cohort, the book by James Davison Hunter, To Change the World, which he himself says is an ironic title because what he wants to suggest is we don't really know what we're saying if we mean by that we're going to change the culture. The, the culture we live in and inhabit is something that is constantly dynamic and it moves and it does alter over time but over long periods of time and it isn't the kind of thing that individual actors can say I will do this and change the culture this way. That doesn't mean however that the the continued faithful life of the church is irrelevant to those things. Here I, I take a little different tack than Hunter in that regard, that as we practice things, the life of the church is to live alternatively in terms of things that nonetheless inhabit the same culture of others around us, but inhabit it in a way in which there's been a redirected loyalty allegiance, a redirected vision of things, a redirected sense of what is really true of the world that comes from the gospel. And in doing that, to live, it, to live in that way at odds with things is the way in which the church's life itself, as is true of all kinds of groups and movements of people, has the capacity to make the experience of life within those cultural terms different for ourselves and others. But it also has that potential to be part of movements that have effect on some of the directions and changes a culture might take. Those are long-term things in terms of the cultural frame of understanding, in terms of social experiences within that. That's where the biggest impact lies. My name is uh, Chris Hoy, and thank you for speaking. I, I had the pleasure of being a part of a missional leadership cohort that uh, Al Roxborough and 
-hmm. and mm -hmm. Mark Lowe Branson led down at Fuller for mm -hmm. two years until, yeah. until my process of trying to lead the local church that I was a part of through the engagement of the missional nature of the church. In, in my sense, just being what the church was intended to be uh, basically led to a crisis point, it, not only in the church, but, but personally, and, and it just, it all kind of exploded and fell apart. So a few years removed from that, um, my, my question is, it's kind of multifaceted. One, does the, does the church, is there, is there really a church if they are not interested in being missional? Because I struggle with that on kind of theoretical nature, sure. theological, like, is it, is it really a church if they, if they refuse the mission of God, the Monsieur Day? And the things that we're um, engaging in when thinking about being missional, about living out the implications of the, the gospel, a lot of times in our established churches and congregations that are, are, are meeting together in a sense to many of them escape from the world, the kind of fortress mentality, the, this idea of engaging the world with the implications of the gospel that it would cause them to move out from their comfort zone back into the place that they've just escaped from is, is a deeply troubling notion for them and, and something hard to grasp as, as um, what you would be calling them to as a leader. So I'm sure you've interacted with church mm -hmm. leaders and in, in some of these settings with that, that tension. If you could, if you could speak to that, because I, I think you've got quite a, a few folks yeah. here that are, they're interested in the pastoral implications of this and how, how to cultivate an environment among their people to really engage these themes, uh, rather than it just being something that's theoretical and stays in the Sunday school classroom. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the question, is a church really a church if it refuses that missional participation with God, is a fascinating one. It probably is one that duplicates itself in many other ways among people with other sets of sort of criteria regarding what is a real church. It's a very tricky dynamic. And I don't doubt that there are times when particular groups that may claim to be a church of Jesus Christ conceivably could not be. But that is a very difficult judgment for any of us to come to, I believe. And, and one of the things that I think about this dimension of missional engagement and readiness to move that way, well, two things. There, there are two perspectives that come to mind that relate to that. One is, one of the affirmations that I made is that to be missional, if this is a church that makes fundamental commitment that Jesus is Lord, however thoroughly, however uniformly, or not, if that is in any sense the genuine confession, and it is a Christian church, then I believe the Holy Spirit has made them missional in their nature, whether they have recognized that in all of its expressions, whether they have modified their life in the direction of those things, whether they want to say in words the word missional or mission or witness or any of those things. They may be very scared. They may be very threatened. They may be very, well, there could be other, other things that they may be. And also, they are coming out of the heritage of a couple thousand years of church experiences. So there may be a long period of this recovery of readiness to acknowledge how the Holy Spirit uses them. But I'm convinced the Holy Spirit uses churches that may resist thinking of themselves this way or resist some of the activities that we would seem are implicated. The Holy Spirit nonetheless makes that community in ways beyond their even knowing a witness to something. I, I think the Spirit doesn't just let churches be not sent communities and not used by the Holy Spirit. And, and there may be small ways that 
a church like that can begin to grow into more conscious relationship with some new things if they begin to observe, wow, the Holy Spirit uses us. We're important to what the Holy Spirit does in the world to extend this witness to the reign of God in Christ. Uh, that, that's a lot of reflection to say that particular affirmation that I'm making has a lot of implications for how we think through that kind of issue. Now, in the second question, maybe that already begins to scratch on that, if I understood it, that there are people. Can, can you reiterate the second question a bit for me again? That would help me to be sure I'm hearing you. Well, overall, I think, is especially in kind of what's been, in, in my mind, deemed as kind of the culture wars that we're in the midst of, pitting us versus them, there's the tendency to have a, a kind of a fortress mentality in in a lot of our churches that that they come to self-identify with something that pits them against the them that's outside the walls of the church, the specific group of people for whom, well, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. Christ died for all, but to think of them as someone that for whom Christ died, that they're being called to um, if if one has, has joined this entity called church or, or, you know, whatever the local expression is called, out of that motivation to escape from the world, then to be called back to the world is, uh, is something that, yeah. that's particularly yeah. troubling. Yeah. And, that's, uh, yeah. and that is the, the crux of the matter for, for the pastor leader type, mm -hmm. is, to, um, is to shove them back out of the nest. So how, how do you do that? Yeah. How do you do that as pastor leader without being shoved out of the nest yourself by the, because it, it happens. It happened to me. <laughs> Depends on which nest you're being shoved out of, I guess. But, but, but as you said that, I, I realize what you're speaking about in terms of that pastoral role and the effect on that. But on the other hand, I wonder if the imagination in a local setting is more going and welcoming people to come with us than shove out of the nest. Now, you might be using that phrase more casually, and I don't want to press that hard, is what you're saying. How can we begin to help folks gain some experience of comfort in small ways that help entertain some possibilities? And how can we pray with them and pray for them in ways that, that God may respond by sending something to them and to their life, which in fact is an unexpected way of relating to somebody that they never would have thought they were relating to. There, there can be all kinds of ways that that happens. I have a sense that uh, you might be right that for some people there is a genuine sort of escape going on. For other folks that I see in churches that are reserved about moving out of the, the comfort zone. It is a place where they have a pause in the storm of trouble and all kinds of things swirling in their life. And for many, they hold on to long time traditions of how we do things because that, that's a sort of a safety net or sort of a, a, an oasis, a place where they can be relieved a bit or where they experience the human connections that are not being found elsewhere. So uh, there can be a lot of things going on there. If there is a, a genuine escape, then the, the question is, how can we help people discover the confidence in what God is doing in them and the world to say, you can walk with God into scary places. This doesn't mean use bad judgment about the nature of that. It's not to just force that issue. But you can trust God. What, what does it mean to build a confidence and trust in God is, is part of the issue. In other words, there's a whole range of things that come into play, I think, in those circumstances. Are they, the other thing that I'd suggest is that there are different ways that a community that has not tended to know this about themselves and where we want to encourage their development in this direction there are a lot of communities that I know about that aren't likely 
to think consciously about this and use this language and sort of reason their way into that. It may come by other routes of small experiences that become more numerous, that become larger experiences, where little by little that can be cultivated in a community. Now, I'm saying things that are sort of obvious and probably don't touch the deepest part of the nerves that you're wrestling with. Hi. Hi. My name is Jody, and um, I would love for you to develop just a little bit more when you were talking about a recovery of community as the people of God. You said that it would, that they would be a living, pulsing display of God's reign. I love that statement. So can you say a little bit more about it? What did it make you think it was? Literally a display of who God is and his love. Yeah, yeah. And so just, I just want you to talk about it more, though. <laughs> okay. Uh, Al Roxborough in some of our ruminations around that book project, uh, talked with us at one point about his son, who at the time was 20-something, who called one day and said, Dad, um, I don't have a job right now. I'm in between work, so I'm coming home to stay for a while. Have you had that happen? Some of us have. And he said, oh, fine, come on. And then he said, by the way, I have five other friends who are in the same situation. They're coming too, okay? So they did. Now, Al loves nothing better than sitting around with half a dozen 20-somethings, drinking coffee, talking, listening, getting acquainted with these folks, which he does. One of the things that he said at the end of that, about six weeks, really, where that was happening, is that he heard in their conversation they had a real hunger and longing for meaning and a longing for connection. It wasn't quite community that they would talk about, but human connection. Then he said he also observed in them they had no idea you could find either of those in church. Now that that sets me to ruminating. What, what is it about us that is failing to be a community of meaning? I think to be a community of meaning and therefore of discernment about both the ethical dynamics of our life and our choices and our relationships with each other but also with the broader world, what kind of community of discernment of our mutual formation of character, of the ways in which we inhabit the mind of Christ or have the mind of Christ inhabit us, as Paul says. It's the kind of practices that we do among ourselves that lead to those things that I'm envisioning in that kind of portrait. A friend of mine, Dick Junkin, who had had experience in Central America in the base community movements, brought a lot of that reflection to his own work in ministry in the U.S. And he was saying some time ago now that we're in the kind of place where there will need to be another form or forms of the life of the church in North America if it is to exist for the long term. And he said, we can't even see now what that would look like. But he said, as a practice on our way there, he commended forming small Christian communities of prayer, discernment, and action. That might be small communities within larger congregations or communities. He wasn't trying to talk about all of those kinds of forms. He was declaring himself he didn't know what the form would need to be in the future, but he believed it would arise out of that set of practices. How do we form life ourselves as a life of a community within a community of prayer, discernment, and action? It seems to me that in many of our churches, we may develop prayer among ourselves in a deep way. 
but I'm wondering sometimes whether we are doing that in such a way that our prayer is about what we have been placed in this world for, and if it is therefore about us being together in that, or if it's about our, our edification in each of our circumstances. Or in the prayer that leads to discernment, which engages the scriptures. Lois Barrett, one of the team members for that book, and I, we had ruminated a lot together because we had a lot of invested, uh, both, both experience but commitment about this necessitates some sort of small group dynamic in which we're face to face and can talk with each other, develop patterns of trust and competence in which that shapes us. And, and she was saying one time, and I immediately realized that I was experiencing something similar, that too often small groups that study the Bible will study a passage, think about it, talk to each other about it, listen to it, and each will make an application about my life and you all about your life, and we go away, but we have not sought, what does it say about our life as a corporate entity? So that's another dynamic of, of what Dick Junkin is commending. Prayer, discernment, and action. Sometimes in our churches, we may have a special bent toward the activities, whether we're full-blown activists or simply lean toward developing plans and doing things, we, we have the actions, but again, how, does that, how is that rooted in that kind of community of prayer and discernment? Is the Holy Spirit, I'm going to ask, is the Holy Spirit able? I, I know the answer to that question ultimately, but, but in practical terms, is the Holy Spirit able to give us out, out of our prayer and in our Bible engagement and in our discernment to lead us to actions we never dreamt we would need to be placed into. And maybe different kinds of actions than we would just come up with as a plan to go do something. So, so it's in that whole complex that I suggest a lot of that takes place in it. It brings mutuality, it's mutual trust and mutual accountability. And in that accountability is then the kind of thing that expresses itself in the patterns of our life. Uh, the Christian practices movement in recent years has done a lot with this to say it's not just the spiritual disciplines that nourish my individual Christian life, but it is the ecclesial practices. What, what are the kinds of things we do with each other and the ways we treat each other, talk to each other, speak honestly, refuse to polarize, but continue in conversation when there's something that's tough to deal with, those kinds of things are the patterns that say the reign of God is at hand because, look, the reconciliation is a dynamic that is underway. It doesn't have to wait till we've solved it entirely, but it is underway, it is happening. I, I think those are the kinds of things that I look at. Any other? Anyone? Okay, last question. Hello? And last question? Go. Joe? You guys are just punting the ball here. Okay. Um, okay. In the multi-faith public conversation, how should announcers of the reign of God learn or, or study or engage religious pluralism? Um, why might it be important for the missional church to become aware of of world religions, and, and I guess more importantly, what character elements would help the missional church or, or us as individuals to to become a contributing part of the uh, public theological conversation? Here's where I agree with one whose writings have affected me very much, uh, Leslie Newbigin, when he describes all Christian witness as dialogue. All missionary representation of the reign of God is dialogue. Because there is necess of necessity the humility that understands while we have come to know something that we really believe we do know and that really is so, that in Jesus Christ God's reign entered into our world in a way that sets it in motion and promises its conclusion 
someday. That is, it, it has altered the situation. And we believe that to be so, but we also believe we don't know all the contours of that. We may misconstrue what we believe about that, but we know this and have confidence that we believe accurately in Jesus. And we will commend that. When Newbegin himself was engaged in India and other places in actual relationships and conversations with people who were Hindu or Muslim or in other faith traditions, he did not think, as some voices would suggest, that interreligious dialogue is a place where, well, we have to come together and perhaps work on something of the common good, but we have to sort of put on pause our own particularity. Uh, that's, that's where there's a difficulty because we cannot really separate ourselves from that even if there are times and places where it is not the best moment to say some of those particular things. We make those judgments, but we, with humility nonetheless, have the best dialogue if we are the most honest and forthright about what we believe to be so and what we therefore have committed our lives to be invested in representing that and living according to that. And we expect others to do the same. It also might imply that in such relationships, we're all becoming, of necessity, available or vulnerable, whichever word fits, to being converted by the other, if we are truly listening to the other and they are willing to listen to us. We are in a, a conversation that has more texture than some formal dialogues between experts tends to be at some times. Now, I've been to some of those where actually that's what I expected, and I found that the representatives of different faiths were not at all reluctant to speak the particularity of what they believed and commend it to one another. But that's where then the conversation can go on, and there are all kinds of reasons to live in comfortable companionship in all kinds of places of life and to share common social space, civic space, responsibility, even while we still hold different particular convictions. So, so there's a sea of things that includes humility, it includes the, the practices of listening and attending to the other, also the willingness to state particularly our own faith. I don't know if that helps or if there's a further way that you're asking that. Great. Well, um, thank you. It's 8 o'clock, and I want to certainly respect our speaker's time, especially because you, you've got a few more days to teach. Yeah. So um, I want to thank you all for being here, but also thank you, Dr. Hunsberger. Thank you. Um, especially on behalf of the seminary, as well as the uh, faculty mentors who you'll be speaking uh, with and for. Thank you.